Well, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Celeste Harrison and on behalf of National Geographic Education, I want to say that I'm so happy to see you all today and to welcome you to another episode of Explorer Classroom. Here at National Geographic, we believe in the power of exploration and wonder to change our world. Our National Geographic explorers are cutting edge scientists and amazing researchers and powerful storytellers and adventurers and conservationists and filmmakers and educators. They're everything, they do it all. Um, but something that all of those amazing, very diverse folks have in common is that they love to share their groundbreaking work with kids like you. Um, so these Explorer Classroom events bring exploration to life, connecting students from all around the world with our explorers for short lessons and time for all of your questions. We team up with our friends at the Mott Foundation to run two of these special after school events each month. And if you'd like, you can have your teachers check out our regular school day programs. Those run three times every school week. Tonight, our explorer is Christine Wilkinson. Christine is a conservation biologist working at UC Berkeley, and she's also the co-founder of Black Mammologist Week. You should check them out on Twitter. They do really awesome work. And Christine is using maps and teamwork to help reduce human carnivore conflict, which can happen when carnivores like hyenas try and eat people's cows and sheep, or when the choices that communities are making can endanger or harm their local animals. She wants to empower communities to make choices that can improve their own lives and allow their awesome carnivores to thrive. Currently, Christine is working to help out with human hyena conflict near Lake the Kuru National Park in Kenya. She's gonna share why her spotted hyenas are amazing creatures, why they're important to, to Kenya and to the world at large. She's also gonna talk about all of her work to protect them. But before we take the time to learn about spotted hyenas, I do wanna say that it's not just me and Christine today. We have students from all around the world joining us. Some of them on screen with us here, some of them out there on YouTube. Hi to you folks as well. We'd love to say hi in the chat bar and answer your questions as well. I'm gonna give a special shout out to our pals in Canada and India and South Africa and all of our friends joining from all across the United States this evening. And with that, I think it's finally time for me to turn it over to Christine for today's Explorer Classroom lesson on spotted hyenas. Awesome. Thank you so much for that fantastic introduction. So I'm Christine Wilkinson and I am a National Geographic Explorer and a PhD student at the University of California, Berkeley. And my research, as she said, is about spotted hyenas and other top predators and how they move and behave in places where people live. So today I'm really excited to talk with you all about spotted hyenas and human carnivore conflict. So we're gonna learn a few things today. It's only gonna be 15 to 20 minutes long. So it's gonna be just an overview of these things, but hopefully you'll come away with some knowledge about what spotted hyenas are and why they're special, how and why we study spotted hyenas in developed landscapes, what human carnivore conflict is, and most importantly, why it's important to involve communities in the research process. So, how many of you have seen this movie? Raise your hand. A lot of you have. If you haven't, it's The Lion King. Now, I really love The Lion King, but there's one reason I don't like it. Those of you who have seen this movie might have noticed that the hyenas are the bad guys in the movie. And in the movie, they're shown as evil and trying to take over Simba's home. You might have also noticed that not only are they evil, but they're kind of dumb in the movie too, like Ed here. But I'm here today to tell you that the cartoon hyenas in The Lion King are almost nothing like hyenas in real life. Real life hyenas are very smart, they have awesome teamwork, and they care for their families. And by the end of today, maybe I'll even convince you that hyenas are cooler than lions. So what are hyenas? They look like bears and cats and dogs combined. So raise your hand, how many of you think that hyenas are most closely related to dogs? Okay, now raise your hand if you think that hyenas are more like cats. Okay, so it turns out that they're actually more like cats than they are like dogs or like bears. 
scientists use something really similar to family trees to help them to organize which animals are more like each other. Just like you are more closely related to your sister or your brother than you are related to your cousins. So on this branch of the family tree or the cladogram as we call it, are all of the animals that are the most like cats. So you have animals called civets up here. You have the common house cat and lions and other large cats here. Down here, you have meerkats like Timon from the Lion King and mongooses. And then on this branch of the tree are the hyenas. And although we're talking about spotted hyenas today, there are actually four different species of hyenas. And on that branch down at the bottom, down here, are all of the dog-like animals, like bears and skunks and dogs and seals and even more than that. So now when your friends and family say that hyenas look like dogs, which they kind of do, you can tell them that hyenas are actually more closely related to your pet cat. Now let's talk a little bit about spotted hyena families. These animals are very social and just like us, they live in family groups and they really care for their families, which are called clans. And spotted hyena families are matrilineal. That means that the females are the boss. They rule everything and they take care of the clans and stay with their female relatives for their whole lives. The males have to move out and find another clan. And spotted hyenas also have special social ranks. For example, if you are the number one female in the clan, it's like you're the queen and your high rank gets passed down to your cubs just because they're related to you. Since the males usually leave the clan and go to another clan, all of the males in one clan are typically ranked lower than all the females. So to study these clans, I drive up to their den where they hang out and I watch them. And sometimes it can get a little bit tricky. You can see this little guy up here is trying to chew on my car's tires. And they also have a tendency to chew on brake lines and get into other types of mischief. And spotted hyenas are also very smart. Research has shown that they are as good or even better at problem solving than chimpanzees are. And because hyenas are so smart, they're also very curious, like you can see in this video that I'll play in the corner. So checking me out, seeing what I'm up to, trying to figure out what's going on. Very smart animals. And since they're so social, Hyenas communicate in many different ways. They use their body language and their voices to send messages to their clan. Just like I'm using my hands a lot to express myself here and showing excitement in my voice as I talk with you all. So let's listen to just two of the many different sounds that hyenas make to talk with each other. The first one is called a whoop. Now listen closely because we're all gonna try and make a whoop in a second. Oops. All right, so these hyenas are using whoops mainly to call other hyenas over, maybe if there's something good to eat, for example. And in the wild, you can hear this whoop from many, many miles away. So let's all give it a try. Practice your whoops. You're gonna lower your head and you're gonna bring up your head and let out the whoop. I'll show you an example. Here we go. Okay, now you try. Do it as loud as you want because you have to call the other hyenas over. Now, if you were a hyena, you would be calling your clan over to you with your whoops. Sometimes the babies try to whoop as well and they sound really, really funny, kind of like this, I'll imitate them. And they kind of just scream at the end, which is really funny to me anyway. Uh, and the second call I want to play for you is the giggle. And hyenas are really famous for their giggling. So here we go. <laughs> so it sounds a lot like laughing, right? Hyenas make this giggling sound when they're excited or when they feel threatened. And these two calls are just a very, very small piece of all of the complex ways that hyenas communicate with one another. 
Now, in order to study hyenas and all of their complex behaviors, we really need to be able to tell them apart from one another. How do we know who is in the spotted hyena family groups? Well, each spotted hyena has a unique spot pattern, just like all of us have a unique fingerprint pattern. And to tell the hyenas apart, we have them all in a book together with photographs of the right and the left side of their body. And many of the hyenas in the place where I work have this distinct circular shoulder pattern. So it can get a little bit confusing, even though the spots are different overall, the spot patterns for each hyena are different, there might be some patterns that are very similar when the hyenas are related to each other. Just like you might have similar eyes, hair, or smile that looks like your parents and your siblings. So among other things, hyenas use their complex communication skills to hunt. And even though the Lion King shows hyenas as being greedy scavengers, eating already dead things or stealing food from the lions, it's actually usually the other way around. Lions are actually more likely to steal food from hyenas. So hyenas hunt and kill most of their food. They're apex predators, just like lions are, which means they're at the very, very top of the food chain. And they eat animals like gazelles, wildebeest, zebra, and warthogs, and sometimes even buffalo and more. And sometimes because they're so clever, they even eat unexpected things. One of my mentors, whose name is Kay Holacamp, and she also works in Kenya on hyenas, once saw some hyenas that looked like they were eating grass, like they were grazing on the grass. But when she got closer, she saw they were actually licking caterpillars off the grass and eating them, which is so crazy. But they also do scavenge. And it's likely that these animals clean up diseases in the environment by eating all of the carcasses. So they're probably really helpful for us. And they're also very resourceful. Now, I bet you've been wondering what this photo is on the right. It's actually spotted hyena poop. The poop is often pure white because they can digest bone. And they're one of the few species that are able to digest bone in the whole world. They also have one of the strongest bites in the entire animal kingdom, up to about a thousand pounds per square inch, which is really strong. So why don't you all take a second to look at this image on the left of hyena skulls over time as they get older and think about what changes you see in the skulls. So if you look at the top of the skull, you can see that the ridge of bone, which is called a sagittal crest, gets a lot taller over time. And you can also see that these parts on the cheek area, which are called zygomatic arches, get a lot thicker and wider. And those two parts of the skull are the simplest way to see that hyenas have huge jaw muscles. The zygomatic arches are wide enough for the big muscles to go through, and the sagittal crest is tall enough to have a lot of muscle attached to it. Basically, hyenas are really, really good at chewing and biting, and they're called the bone crushers for a reason. Okay, so just a quick warning. On the next slide, you're gonna see some carcasses with some blood. Nature is pretty messy, and I'm trying to keep it real with you all. Here we go. So not only do hyenas eat wild animals, they also sometimes eat domestic animals like cows and sheep for an easy snack. And if any of you have chickens or goats or other pets, you can imagine how scary it would be to worry about your animals or your pets being eaten, right? So where I work, some people put up special cow pens like this one here to keep hyenas and other predators out. And they also have cloth, this green cloth, that makes it hard for the predators to see through the fence and know what's inside. And hyenas attacking livestock like cows and sheep is just one component of what we like to call human carnivore conflict. But human carnivore conflict also includes perceptions of conflict and people's risk perceptions about the carnivores that live near them. The third main component of human carnivore conflict is retaliation. For example, there are many places where predation or threats to humans or people's perceived risks about carnivores are so high that people will poison carnivores like hyenas. So to understand and solve human carnivore conflict, which is a really complex issue, it's important not just to know how, where, and when carnivores pose a threat, but also to involve communities in the research process and listen to people's concerns in a meaningful way. So for my research, it's really important to us to involve these communities in this process. 
And we used a tool called participatory mapping to understand how people see their surroundings and how they're experiencing conflict with hyenas and with the other carnivores. So basically in these mapping sessions, people would be interviewed, then they would use a map to draw their experience with livestock predation in the area and also draw where they are afraid to go because hyenas and other carnivores are there in the landscape. And they also were drawing where they think hyenas and other carnivores should be able to live on that landscape with people. We then made the paper maps into digital maps. And not only did this give us valuable data to work with, but it also got community members involved in the research from the beginning and got people talking about what their conservation priorities were personally. So even though we think of animals like hyenas and lions living free and roaming around the landscape like you see on TV, there are actually a lot of places where hyenas live side by side with people. And this photo is the national park where I work, Lake Nakuru National Park. And there's a tall, mostly electric fence surrounding the entire park. A big reason that it's there is to try and stop human wildlife conflict. Can you imagine if every park and natural area you went to had a fence around the whole thing? That is a lot of work to maintain. But the fence is there to help with conflict and to protect people from animals and protect the animals from people. But these fences might also be affecting the ecology more broadly, since wildlife want to move through them and might not be able to get through. So my team, we put up motion sense cameras and we used this behavioral classification to understand how mammals are behaving around the national park fence. For our purposes, the most important behaviors were crossing into the park and crossing out of the park and also carnivores searching or attempting to cross through the fence. So for example, this leopard here knows there's a hole here. It's kind of sniffing at the hole and trying to get through. Um, and we can assume that a lot of the time they do get through. Spotted hyenas are particularly adaptable to these fences, likely because of their really high intelligence. And they're able to learn new tricks to get through the fences. Our cameras showed hyenas crossing in and out of the park every single day. So raise your hand if you have done yoga or if your parents have done yoga. I've done yoga. Hyenas do a little yoga too to get through the fences. I like to call it downward facing hyena. And remember when I told you that hyenas are very smart? Here's an example of what happens when you try to keep the hyenas and other animals from going in and out of the national park underneath the fence. So the guy just put some boulders there to try and block the animals from getting in and out. And we think that the spotted hyenas can almost always figure out how to get through again. See, just got through. Now, now everybody's gonna get through pretty easily. No, oh, there you go. But we still wanna know more. Since people are dealing with hyenas threatening their livestock, Hyenas are also being poisoned by people in some places in Sub-Saharan Africa. We want to understand how hyenas are moving through the landscape and near places where people live. So along with doing that participatory mapping with community members, we also worked with our Kenyan colleagues to put GPS collars on the hyenas' necks. Since we can't see what hyenas are doing all the time because they're so clever, these collars help us to track their movements and see where they go. And as you can see in this picture, these collars are very thick and durable so that the hyenas with their powerful bites won't be able to destroy them very easily. And here's an example of what the collar data look like. On the left is just two days of information from our collars. And the collars use satellites to find out the animal's location, just like when you or your parents use Google Maps to get somewhere in the car, for instance. And for each animal, we get a location every five minutes, which is a lot of data. We only take these locations at night since hyenas are more active at night. So on this map on the left where everything's moving, when you see the pause, that means it's daytime, okay? And the blue one, they're moving quite a lot. You can see this blue one is moving in and out of the national park into the nearby wildlife conservancy almost every single day, even though the park is fenced. On the right side map, we combined the data from the GPS collars with the information from our community participatory mapping that I told you about earlier, showing where people have seen or heard spotted hyenas. 
So these colored splotches are the ranges of the hyenas based on the collar data. And these kind of purple circles are where people have seen or heard concentrations of hyenas. As you can see, this big hotspot that I've circled here might have hyenas in it that we didn't know about before and we weren't able to put the collars on. Now we know to go and take a look there and see if we can find that hyena clan and put a collar on. This is a great example of participatory mapping, not only providing information, but also helping us to do more accurate future research and conservation. So overall in our study site, despite the threats and negative perceptions they face, we think spotted hyenas are pretty good at adapting to humans on the landscape, but we're still doing more research on them to see what they're up to. And we're gonna keep talking with the local communities to hear their perspectives about hyenas and hyena conservation over time. Okay, so we're coming to the end now. So I have to ask you all, raise your hand if you like hyenas. All right, that's awesome. It looks like I've convinced some of you about how cool hyenas are, no matter what you see in the movies. Now raise your hand if you think conservation is complicated. And it definitely is. Even if you never see a hyena in real life, there are so many other animals in our world that are misunderstood and have very complex conservation stories. And here on the slide are just a few that I can think of that I think are really interesting. I guarantee you, you live near a misunderstood animal. So what can you all do? Well, I really think it's up to all of us to learn more about these misunderstood animals and about how conservation of all species is complex and there isn't always a simple answer. To make conservation work and last a long time, it's up to us to work with local communities and really listen to their perspectives and their fears about these animals so that we can work toward lasting conservation for the animals that are important for ecology while also empowering people. So we've certainly learned a lot in a short amount of time today. We learned about what spotted hyenas are and why they're special, how and why we study spotted hyenas in these developed landscapes they share with people, what human carnivore conflict is, and of course, why it's so important to involve people in the research process. I hope you all learned something new. And if you're interested to learn more about carnivores or conservation or getting involved, you can reach out to me anytime. And with that, I'll take some questions. Oh, Christine, thank you so much for your work, for your energy, for your presentation, and for graciously offering to answer our questions. Students, it is the best time of day. It is question time. If you're watching on YouTube, keep chatting us those questions. They're great. Be sure to let us know who's asking so we can give you a shout out. If you're up here on screen with me, get those nice loud voices ready. Our first question, Christine, is coming to us from the YouTube chat bar. Corey is wondering, what kind of wild animals hyenas normally hunt? Specifically, do you know of uh, a hyena ever hunting an African dog? That's a good question. Um, so typically the hyenas will usually go for what we call ungulates, which are animals with hooves that tend to eat grass or bushes. Um, they like to go, when they're in groups, they'll go for zebras. They might kind of chase down a Thompson's gazelle, which are quite small little gazelles on their own for a long period of time. Impalas, they like to get, um, they'll even hunt like young versions of very large animals like buffalo or sick ones. Um, so they're, they're pretty, they'll go for anything. I haven't heard of them hunting an African wild dog, which by the way, those are so cool. Um, but I would imagine if there was some sort of territorial dispute or some sort of dispute over food or something like that, maybe there might be a casualty in the process, but I'm not sure about that. Awesome, so much left to explore. Well, we've got Jamie in the chat bar asking the hard questions. Christine, Jamie would like to know how many spots do typical spotted hyenas <laughs> actually have? That is a, such a fantastic question. Um, I have never ever counted the spots on any of the hyenas I work with. We could do an estimate. Um, but a fun fact to partially answer your question is some hyenas have a ton of spots all like crowded together. And sometimes they can be even distinctive because you're like, oh, that's the one with like a lot of squished spots. And some of them are really faded and have like larger faded spots that are super hard to see. So I think it probably varies is the answer, but maybe uh, I'll count a couple of the ones that I work with and get back to you on that. Love it. All right, well, let's take a question from an on-screen student. Let's visit Audrey for our next question. Go for it, Audrey. You can unmute that microphone and ask with a nice loud voice. Thank you. 
My question is, um, is there anything you're interested or no? Um, is there anything you're learning in Africa that about hyenas that could help wolves in the USA? That's a fantastic question, Audrey. Thank you. Um, I would say there is a lot that we are learning about hyenas that can help wolves in the USA because in um, Africa, people usually don't really like hyenas that much, spotted hyenas at least. And they're really kind of villainized, like they're kind of hated or feared and or people just kind of aren't a fan. And the same can be said for wolves. Our country, if you're in the USA, has a long history of, um, you know, we, we killed off a lot of or all of our wolves and then we reintroduced them to Yellowstone and now they're kind of spreading out again. And um, they used to be killed by us. And now there's a lot of uh, folks who rely on their livestock, on their cows and their sheep and their goats that are worried about wolves coming back and maybe killing their, their source of uh, food or their source of um, livelihood. So I think that the, the same human carnivore conflict and like kind of negative perceptions apply to wolves here. And we can learn a lot from what we've done in East Africa or in Africa in general, to figure out how to kind of connect with folks on the ground, see their side of the story and create this listening across people who maybe have different views on wolves. So that's a great question, thank you. Great question and an awesome answer. And our next great question is coming to us from Corey in the chat bar. Corey is wondering how you're getting this data, Christine. Are you just like sneaking up on hyenas and hoping they don't notice? Is, are they really okay with people getting close to them? How does it work to work with hyenas? Um, that's a great question. I think that there are a few different answers to that, but I'll tell you how we captured our hyenas and put collars on them. People do it in different ways. Um, for our way, you get a speaker that like a, you know, something that can blast out some sound and you actually make a, uh, some recordings of those whoops that I was telling you about to try and call hyenas in. Um, and you play those. And then I had a, a wonderful vet veterinary team in Kenya that would, we would coordinate over WhatsApp, which is like a chat thing. Um, and it was kind of like a little battle plan. Like it'd be like, okay, I'm calling the hyenas in over here. You should come around here. I think we should get this one because of these reasons and aim for this one when you use your dart. Um, and we would kind of triangulate with our cars and then get the animal and make sure that they go down in a, in a safe place and uh, kind of make sure that they're safe. And it was, it was really exciting. It's a very exciting part of the process for sure, but it's um, something that you need to be very conscious about so that you're keeping the animal safety in mind. That's awesome, thank you. Well, let's go to Anian and Tille for our next question. Go for it folks, you can unmute and ask away. Um, out of the species of hyenas, which one would be the dominant one? And um, do the other hyena species um, scavenge? Good question. Um, so I think that the, there are a few ways to answer your question, your first question. Spotted hyenas are kind of the most ubiquitous. They're able to adapt a lot. They are able to eat all sorts of different things, as I told you about. I don't know if that makes them the most dominant, but I think that they're the ones that have the most promise for surviving across a really broad landscape. That being said, striped hyenas are also, are not just in Africa, but they're also in parts of Asia. They're the only hyena species that's also in Asia. The others are all in Africa. And then for your second part of your question, um, the other species eat the following things. So there's the striped hyena, which is like really furry and striped. And uh, usually they'll scavenge or they'll maybe eat some very small prey. They'll hunt some small prey like rabbits and that kind of thing. Um, but they're mostly scavengers. The brown hyena, which is the most, uh, we think is the most threatened one of the four, um, as far as you know, its populations being threatened, is a scavenger. And it's just big, brown, fluffy bear looking thing. And then the Ardwolf is a really special one. It's also striped like the striped hyena, but it's very skinny, doesn't have as much like fluff going on. And they actually eat insects instead. So they're like the wild card. Um, and we don't know, they're very reclusive. Like they, they kind of hide away. So we don't know that much about um, their ranges, but we are redoing all of the range maps right now. 
to make sure that they're all accurate where all of these different species live. Awesome. And speaking of maps, we've got Miss R and her class in the chat bar. They noticed all that movement of your hyenas on your map. And they're wondering what's a normal amount of travel for one hyena for one day? Um, good question. We're actually working on those analyses right now for our spotted hyenas, but something really special about the, this particular area is that it's kind of like two protected areas right next to each other, surrounded by a lot of human development. So they're very small protected areas relative to some of the other really, really vast landscapes you might have seen on TV. So these animals actually like don't have super far that they can travel. Um, but that being said, they do like to stay within their ranges for the most part, within their like home range for their clan because they're territorial species. But if the males, I told you the males like to leave and go to a different clan, it's called dispersing. And when the males disperse, they can go quite, quite a long ways away to try and get far enough away that they're not going to mix their genes with their family. Now, we don't really know what the males are doing in our field site because they don't have very many places to go because there's so much development. So that's something that we're gonna try and see is just how far these animals actually can leave. Awesome. All right, well, let's visit Kaya for our next question. Go for it, Kaya, nice loud voice for us. Um, will another female try to become queen of the clan? Yeah, Kaya. So I did mention that it's um, mostly kind of the rank is passed down and then you maybe you'll be the queen if you were the cub of the last queen, but there are clan takeovers. So um, maybe a, a matriarch dies and then uh, another kind of dominant female will come in and try and take over before the other, uh, the cub of that matriarch gets to become the queen. That has been seen in lots and lots of cases. So yes, it's not always by family. Awesome. We've got Jason in the chat bar who is wondering if hyenas hunt in packs and what kind of tactics do they use to bring down their prey? Great question. Um, so they actually have, uh, they live in what we call a fission fusion kind of social situation. So what that means as far as hunting is that they can hunt alone, they can hunt in a small group or they can hunt in a large group. And when you see them hunting alone, you'll see them kind of, um, I guess trying to wear out the, the prey in some ways, they can run up to 40 miles an hour, but they'll kind of course after this prey. And I, I actually watched one hyena go for a Thompson's gazelle, which is a small gazelle for like 20 minutes before kind of just being like, ah, never mind, I'll go back to the den. But they'll, they'll kind of course after them because um, they have a lot of endurance. But if they're going for something larger, they might come and just, you know, as a, as a clan come and try and hunt down a larger animal like a zebra or something like that. So cool. Well, let's visit the Lawson brothers, Lennon and Hendrix. Go ahead and unmute your microphone and ask away. Um, how much do they eat in a day? That's a great question. I am not sure I know the specific answer to that question, but I have to tell you, I wish I had pictures for you right now because I have seen a hyena on many occasions on those cameras that I showed you leaving the park and going and clearly hunting or getting a cow or something like that and coming back and they can't fit through the hole in the fence because they're so, so fat and full of food. And you can just see their stomachs almost touching the ground. So when they do eat, they really gorge themselves. They don't, they don't hold back. They'll get really, really big. And it's pretty funny to see, but I'm sorry. I don't know the, the actual pounds of food that they can eat in a day. Amazing. I love the imagery of a hyena just gorging itself. So cool. Um, well, we've got Aiden who is wondering what exactly a hyena needs in its habitat because Aiden is wondering if there's anywhere in the U.S. that you think a hyena could live besides a zoo. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think that would be a very interesting U.S. for sure. So some, one thing that they, although they're very adaptable, one thing that they do need is somewhere to den. So usually when they have a, um, a den, it's something that has been dug out by warthogs or something like that, that they go and adapt and kind of, it's just like a network of holes and passages that the cubs can hide in. The adults usually don't go in there. Um, and without that den or something that will serve as a den or a hole for them, they, they probably wouldn't subsist super long with their cubs being in danger. Um, but that being said, 
they're really, really adaptable. Like they can um, survive in all sorts of landscapes. I was actually, I'm on the IUCN hyena specialist group. And I was talking to the head of that group about what it would look like to make a habitat suitability, which is like the suitable habitat for a spotted hyena in the world. And we're kind of struggling with it because they're just so adaptable. Um, as far as in the US, uh, I think that they're, they're quite good at hunting things down in open landscapes, but they can survive in so many different places that who knows what would happen if we put a hyena in the landscape. Fun fact that you reminded me of, I'm here on UC Berkeley campus, and we used to have a clan of spotted hyenas here that was used for research purposes. They were not just roaming the hills, although you could hear them at night. Um, they were, uh, I think I just missed them. They got rid of the last one and sent it to a zoo or somewhere else in 2013 because they were kind of done with the research. But that's crazy, right? Like Berkeley, California, hyenas. So neat. All right, let's take our next question from Paul. Paul, go for it. Can hyenas carry diseases? Paul, fantastic question. So it's hyenas are pretty exciting creatures because they're resistant to a lot of diseases, even though they might still carry them. So for instance, there is a really harmful disease called anthrax that um, these kind of vegetarian hoofed mammals will pick up this disease and they'll start to all die. And when hyenas eat those diseased kind of carcasses, the, they don't get anthrax. They're able to survive the anthrax. So some people are like, oh, perhaps they clean the anthrax out of the environment and that could be a really good thing. Um, I know that in the past, that mentor I told you about, Kay Holocamp, who saw the hyenas eating the caterpillars, she was approached by the military um, trying to get her to study how the blood of hyenas um, is so resistant to disease because they wanted to be able to use that knowledge for military purposes. So they're pretty, pretty cool animals. Absolutely amazing. Well, let's visit our friends Veronica and Colias for our next question. Go for it, folks. Okay, what's your question? Um, if you state different snake prints, do, do do hyena make from the same animals? Yeah, can you say it? Do hyena say it loud? Animals, do hyena make from the Okay, I think I think his sister is going to ask it for him. He just can't speak loud enough. Okay, go for it. Totally. Do, do hyenas make friends with other animals? Um, good question. I, I haven't ever seen a hyena make friends with another animal of a different species. That's not to say it will never happen because I know you've probably seen those really interesting videos of uh, like the coyote and the badger and the, um, the lion that took care of the baby gazelle or whatever it is. So I don't think that they do that as a general species, but maybe there are some individual cases we don't know about. Um, something to make note of, humans are an animal, and I know that in Harar, Ethiopia, the hyenas come in and help kind of uh, clean up the city streets of different things, and they also, these people feed the hyenas from their mouths. So I guess they've made friends with people in some places. Thanks for the question. Awesome. Well, we've got Grace, who is five years old, and Grace is wondering just how much a hyena can eat. What's the biggest thing you've seen it take down? And do you think it could take down a Mustang horse? I think that it could take down a Mustang horse because they do like to hunt zebra. That's one of their primary prey. And zebra are probably well, a little smaller than a Mustang horse, maybe, but not too far off. And these animals are strong. So remember I told you they have a thousand pounds per square inch in their bite force. So they can really, really get something if they, if they want it. Um, as far as the biggest thing I've ever seen them take down, I have seen uh, videos of hyenas taking on a full-size buffalo. Um, I have seen them, they didn't take down the giraffe, but the giraffe got electrocuted by a power line and they just like, decimated that thing in, in not too long, like in maybe a day or two. Um, this is a little bit tangential, but 
something really fun about hyenas in terms of if you're driving around the landscape in the savannah and you're you find something that's um clearly there's been a kill maybe you see some vultures you're like okay what are the vultures going for you see what's been killed if you see uh like a, a whole skeleton you know it's not hyenas if you see a patch of blood and maybe like one hoof and then everything else is gone the hyenas took that they are they will as i said digest bone so they can really do a lot of work on those big carcasses so cool well let's go back to the hendrix brothers for another question Go for it, guys. Let me click the button that perfect. Um, how much teeth do hyenas have? How many teeth? Yeah. Um, they have 20 something teeth. I forget actually how many teeth they have. Um, good question. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer, but they are very frightening teeth, uh, <laughs> as you might have seen in my slide. You do not want to be bitten by their teeth, however many they have. Absolutely not, especially not with that bite strength. Um, we've got a great question in the chat bar. Folks are wondering why uh, the parks are trying to keep hyenas out in the first place, especially since they're just dipping right under those fences. So. They, the fence that I showed you around the national park is actually meant to keep the hyenas in. And what they don't want is for them to get out and eat people's cows and things like that. However, we're kind of looking at our collar data from the GPS collars and seeing how often they're actually going out to go into the community versus how often they're going out to go into that next door protected area, the conservancy I told you about. Um, because the conservancy has like 6,000 cows on it that maybe are like all in one place and are easy to access. And so we're kind of wondering whether they're going in there for an easy meal or they're going in there to try and access like the, the kind of trash heaps where they put the extra pieces of cow that are like not being used. Um, or if they're going in there to try and disperse because they don't have very many places for the males to exit their clan and go join a new one. So the fence is meant to protect people, but it's also, um, a large reason for the fence is to help the rhinos to survive. So there are rhinos in the national park. Those are very endangered and they're worried about poachers coming in and poaching those rhinos. Awesome. Well, Christine, we know incredible bite force, white poop, able to digest bone. What are some other fun facts we should keep in mind for, for hyenas? Um, I just really like that hyenas have so much girl power, as I like to call it. They are just like the queens of the savanna. Females are a lot bigger than males. Um, the males kind of are very much like bowing to the females and, and respecting their, their authority. And uh, they seem to be succeeding. So maybe our, our human world can learn from the hyenas on that front. Brilliant. We've got a lot of people in the chat bar who are wondering how they can keep up with your work and send you more questions in the future. Is there somewhere good to follow along with you? Yeah, you can go either to my website, scrappynaturalist.com, and or you can go to my Twitter, which is almost the same thing, except Twitter handles are very short. So it's scrap naturalist is my Twitter if you want to keep up with me. And my email is all over the internet if you ever have a burning question. Amazing. Well, for our last question on Explore Classroom, I always like to ask Christine, what advice do you have for all these young explorers joining us today? Um, I love that question. So my biggest advice is don't be afraid to try new things. If you see an opportunity that you think is really exciting for you, whether you're interested in animals or something else, just give it a try. You know, you have to start somewhere. It's okay to not know how to do a thing. Um, and the more that you kind of jump in and try new things, or even like uh, reach out to the people that you admire and ask them how they got to where they are going, the more that you can learn from them and kind of get these new exciting adventures into your life and learn more about what you're interested in. So just don't be afraid. Love it. Well, Christine, this has been absolutely amazing. I hope that you've all had a great time too. We'd love to stay in touch. Scrap Naturalist for Christine at Nat Geo Education for us. We use hashtag Explore Classroom. We'd love to have you join our little internet community and keep these cool conversations going. 
Um, if you do a follow-up activity from the event guide, we'd love to see your work as well. It's really inspiring to see what you students are doing out there. Um, if you'd like to explore more with us, we have Explore Classroom plus many, many, many more free educational resources available at natgeoed.org. And I hope to see you all again soon. I wanna say another round of thank yous. So thank you to our friends at Mott for supporting this event and our after school work. I wanna thank Christine again for all of her amazing work and her awesome presentation today. Um, and I wanna thank all of you guys for these stellar questions. This has been so much fun. Uh, so with that, our students have been so patient and so thoughtful and so wonderful. On the way out, let's just like make a bunch of noise we can scream goodbye and thank you, or we can also whoop like hyenas. I feel like I'm more inclined to whoop like hyenas today. So I'm gonna go ahead and ask to turn on all of the microphones. And on the way out, as we sign off, let's whoop like hyenas. Whoop like, a that goes? whoop like a hyena. Whoop like a hyena.